boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was, was at the land to which they were going. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. Jesus, after feeding 5,000 people, Jesus, after feeding 5,000 people, uh, <clears throat> the people were coming to try and make him king. So Jesus know that they want to make him to the political Messiah, but he's not the political Messiah. He is the spiritual eternal Messiah. That's why we have to detach our eyes from the political and the temporal material kingship and life. This message is about selling through the world with and without Christ. Do you know why I'm using the word selling? Because this is the people going through the Sea of Galilee. The disciples were pounded by big waves. It was very dark. One is dark. Two is pounding by big waves. They were really struggling. And Jesus came to them at 3 o'clock in the morning, walking on the water. Just give you a little bit of background. This, this is from the commentary. The Sea of Galilee is located in a depression some 700 feet below sea level. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below the sea level. And ringed by hills, many of them quite steep. When the cold air descends from Mount Hermon's crown, 9,000 feet high, the cold air comes down and crashes down against the warm air at the, lake, at the level of the lake, violent storms suddenly occur. So this is what happened. So today I want to talk to you about our life as Christians. It's like going through the Sea of Galilee. Like our lives, yeah, <laughs> you're all there, right? After our life, going through the Sea of Galilee, we face storms. I want to deal with the question, is why do we have to face storms? And how do we handle storms? Eventually, what does Jesus do to help us? Basically, three main things, but I'll break down a little bit different there. Number one, the condition of the church in the world. The condition of the church in the world. You know, this is a hostile world we live in. It's, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the evening came, the disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. If you read Matthew 14, the disciples didn't get into the boat on their own. Jesus sent them into the boat. Jesus, you go in the boat, you cross the sea, I'm coming right after you. Jesus said, nobody's going to make me king. He's going up to the mountain to pray to God the Father. And then he sent the disciples out. That was like getting dark, 5, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, coming dark. He said, disciples, go. You know, this is a hostile war. The, 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 the selling of the disciples across the sea is whose idea? Jesus' idea. So I want you to know that we, our Christian life going through this world is like sailing through the world of storms. Look around in this world. You see how, how many storms we face in this world. You either face a storm of God or the storm of the world. And you have to choose one. Christians are at peace, great friends with God, but at war with, with sins and the world and Satan, the devil. But non-Christians, people in the world, are at war with God, but they are good friends with this world and the devil. If you are good friends with God, they will fight you in this world. They, they go out war with you in this world. But these sufferings and hostility in this world is only what? How, long, how many years do you want to live in this world? 90 years, 100 years? That's what you do. But if you're at war with God, you're going to spend eternity in sufferings coming out. There'll be millions and millions and billions of years coming. I want to give you a contrast so that you understand. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 3 says this. And you were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. Who is the prince of the power of the air? The devil. The Bible says you were dead. Before Christ, all of us were dead. Not dead physically, dead spiritually. Spiritually, we were dead. Boom, going straight to hell. And guess who's, who did we follow? All of us, all of the world without Christ, follow who? Not follow Jesus, follow the devil. Because there's a, he is the prince of the power of the air. What fancy name, right? That's from the Bible, prince of the air. What did he do? He is a spirit that now at work the sons of disobedience. If you look around this world, all the riots, all the disobedience, protests, and all these things, they are challenging the, uh, the godly values from the Bible. They are the works by the spirit of disobedience. Did you know that kids, even from young age, have default values? We are naturally want to be disobedient. The more you tell the kids, the kids, the more, hmm, I just want to try the other way. You know why? Because we got that from our grand-grand-grandparents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were perfect until they fell. Let me tell you, I thought about it this morning. Let me ask you this question. If the devil can get a perfect man and perfect woman to fall, what do you think? his chances of getting fallen men and women like us today to fall. We have absolutely no chance to stand against the prince of the air until and unless the Lord God, the Son of God, came to this world and rescue us and make us strong and we will fight this battle together. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus did. He sent them into the boat, but he's not leaving them behind. But they did struggle. They did struggle. Let, verse, let me finish this verse. Verse 3 says, Among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh. The passions of our flesh. What is that? That is Prince of the Air's work. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. You know what? Wrath, anger, anger of God, judgment of God. By nature, we were all children of wrath, children of the judgment of God, like the rest of mankind. I believe. The world and the Christian theological world is not given the due recognition of the power and the work of the prince of the air, the spirit of disobedience. Let me just make a statement here. All right. So I want to give you, uh, why would this storming, pounding at us? What do we do? It's just a little bit of that, and then we'll talk more later on. Because in Psalm 121, verse 1 to verse 4 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Very, very good verse. Memorize it. You need it every now and then. Psalms, a lot of other places, but I just picked one today for the sake of illustration. This is a good one. From where does my help come from? When you are rowing the boat, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and pounded by the waves, you're supposed to sleep, but you go woken up by the pounding of the waves, and it was so scary. The boat was rocking. You know, it was so scary. You're going to die or something. You cry out to God. That's a prayer you want to pray. When you're going through hardship, when you go through sickness, when your children are going disobedience, the prince of the air, guess who's work? Prince of the air. You want to say this prayer. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now that is a powerful line. My help comes from the Lord. Who is the Lord? The Lord is the one who made Heaven and the earth. He made the waves that pounded at you too. Everything is made by him. So I just want to comfort you a little bit, strengthen you. The emphasis is that the Lord who made heaven and earth. So when you go through difficult times like what the disciples are doing, you call out to the, to the Lord who made heaven and earth. John chapter 16, verse 33 say, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that in me you have peace. In this world, you will have tribulations. Tribulation is hardship and suffering. Jesus promised us we will have tribulations. But take the tribulations now. Bite the bullet and you overcome it. Be an overcomer. 
Never give in. Never be a never never be a lame duck. Never be weak. Because at the end of it, you come out strong, stronger, stronger. That's what he wants. At the end of it, you come out to be more beautiful. He's preparing a bride. He's preparing the church as a beautiful woman that he's going to marry. At the wedding of the feast in the book of Revelations. There are many, 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 many uh, facets you look at it, okay? So, so he said, in this world, you have tribulations. If you don't have tribulations... You gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. Are you following Jesus? I want to exhort you and challenge you this morning. Think about this. I want you to go deeper in Christ. Jesus said, In this world, you have tribulations. If you don't have tribulations, then you make him a liar. But his last words, he said, But take heart. I have overcome the world. I love and how Jesus puts it. The Lord. He never said he wants you. You better be strong. You go into this world, the world's going to hate you, the world's going to pound at you, you will have tribulations, and stop there. I just don't like, that's why I love to read scripture in context, because next verse he says, but take heart. The word but is being very, very important. I warn you all these things, but, very important line coming, take heart, don't worry. I have overcome the world. Do you know how much it takes for Jesus to overcome the world? Do you know how much it cost him to overcome the world? Being the son of God, he had to pay a huge price to overcome. He cried to God the Father. He bleeded with blood on his sweat. He had to go through that. Why? Because the sufferings in this world is nothing compared to eternal blessings. Eternal joy coming. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said again, I'm sending out like sheep among wolves. Sheep among wolves. I'm sending you to places where are wolves waiting for you. Therefore, be as shrewd as snake and be as innocent as doves. Be shrewd as snake. That's from wisdom. That's from the book of Proverbs. You need to read Proverbs a lot. And then be innocent as doves. You need to read the rest of the book. Doves. Okay, point two, point two. Number two. Reasons why the first disciples had to endure the storm and also why Christ's disciples today must endure trials. In fact, I'll add another word to that line and overcome trials. To endure and overcome. I want to talk to you why the disciples in Jesus' days had to endure the trials so that they learned to overcome. Listen to me. You can never know what it means to overcome if you don't have trials. If life is just so smooth for you, you never, you never know what it means to overcome. And Jesus returns that, did you overcome? Lord, there's nothing for me to overcome. Uh-oh, that's just too bad. Too bad news. You don't want that. You know, that's why you want to... You want to, to, to serve God. Once you start walking with God, serving God, you immediately become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. They will throw things at you. Fast. Fast. So I want to tell you that why we have to endure trials and why do we, and why we will have to overcome. Number one, I'll give you two sub points here, okay? First is the nature of the environment in which we live. I kind of covered that just now, right? Jesus, John explains the storm by saying that a strong wind was blowing. Verse 18. The Sea of Galilee is by nature a dangerous body of water. The same may be said of our whole world. There are strong and deadly winds blowing against, across it. You read the news. You know it is not easy. It's getting harder and harder to be Christians. The, the world's values are just crushing on us. First one, first reason, is because the nature of this world we live in. But second one, this, I want to talk a lot more on this one. Second reason, and this is an important one, because Jesus sent them. Because Jesus sent the, the disciples into the storm. <laughs> if you like my kind of poetic kind of description, Jesus sent the disciples into the storm. He knew the storm is coming. He knows everything. He sent them into the storm. He knows that he will back them up. So don't worry. God is going to send us into the storm because this is a refining 
fire. God is going to refine us and make us strong. Likewise, Christians endure difficulties because of the calling of the Christian life. The word calling is very important. If you are called by God, and every Christian is called by God, don't ever think that only the pastor is called by God. That's why it's called priesthood for all believers. Priesthood for everyone. The Catholic Church used to say only the, the, the what do you call it? the priest and all this, the bishop can access the Bible and they are called by God. Everybody else just listen in Latin. <laughs> Reformation broke the gate open. We are all priesthood of believers now. We are all saints. We are all priesthood. So we are to, 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 to uh, receive the call of God. Unbelievers, I say that right, unbelievers are at war with God, but at peace with sin. Christians are at peace with God, but at war with sins and the devil and the world. So we are the ones called to resist temptations that live against the grain of the world. Did you hear I say? The grain of the world. We're going against the grain of the world. The sexuality. You go to the school now. They try to bring this or teach all these classes to you now. They, we are going against the grain of the world. If we don't all build our young people strong and rooted in the word of God, now they don't have a chance to survive spiritually in college. I experienced it myself. I experienced some of my kids went through that. I'm still recovering from the shock of it. You know what? My kids went to a very top high Ivy League school. Ivy League maybe, but it turned out to be very disappointing in some of the things happening. Okay? We are going against the grain of the world. And that means this brings us into the trials of mockery, persecution, and fierce combat with our sinful flesh. The world's going to throw mockery at us, hatred at us. Jesus said they will hate you. You better believe every word Jesus said. They will hate you. And don't get disappointed. Don't get shocked. Why do they hate me? Why? Because, because the world's on the dark side and you are with the Lord. John chapter 15, verse 13 and verse 20. This is a very important verse. I'm going to expound a little bit here. John 15, 13 to 20. John is such a powerful book and I'm glad I'm preaching through this book. Greater love has no one than this. that someone... Lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. This is Jesus speaking, right? You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I made known to you. Do you know what the song we sang just now? Even though you are king, but you are my friend. You are my brother. This is so true. You know, I, I'm always moved reading about Psalms and the, pro, and the Gospel and the Bible in my daily devotion. How Jesus, the almighty, omnipotent God, walking on water, raised the dead, cleansed the leper, cast out demons, and he come down and say, I'm no more calling you servant. I'm calling you my friends. The intimacy with Jesus is incredible. You can never find it in any religion or any idolatry, any good things you want to look for in this world. They will never give you the satisfaction, intimacy. Chris, Christianity is so personal. Jesus said, I call you friends. Why am I calling you friends? Let me expound, expound this a little bit here. Why did Jesus say, I call you friends? First, because I laid down my life for you. That means I died for you. I, I died crushing death for you. They just didn't give me a bullet. They make me suffer on the cross and bleed for you first. And then he said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Do you know how to become Jesus' friends? Do what he commands you. You are no more Jesus' friends <laughs> if you break the commandments. And then you come back to him, he will receive you as his friends. But I'm just saying this real quick here, comment, okay? Is that... No longer I call you servants. You know, you know the context is this. This is the creator God. And these human beings like us are his creation. God, creator, talking to creations. You are my friend now. That's, that's a big chasm you have to cross. Jesus has crossed right through. You know that story? Abraham and the, and the, and the, and the beggar on the heaven. And the rich man was suffering in hell asking a Lazarus to come down, bring some water and on, his, on, the, on his tongue because he's suffering, tormenting in hell. And Father Abraham said, 
uh, rich man, sorry, we cannot cross to you because there's a chasm. There's a huge chasm you cannot cross. And Jesus crossed it. Jesus crossed right into our human life. He said, I die for you. Now, after Jesus established himself the greatest lover for the elect Christians, he went to say, I call you friends. Okay? So, <laughs> that's what I wrote down here. The intimacy Jesus has for us, those of us who opens up to him and, and, and obey his commands, therefore, because it's called us friends, to that level, as God, lukewarm Christianity cannot be in the chemistry relationship with him. We cannot be lukewarm with Jesus. That's impossible. Have you ever fallen in love with a girlfriend or a boyfriend when you were dating before you got married? Those of you who are married. Do you think you can be lukewarm in a relationship with the girl you, you love or the man you love? It's just this is oxymoron. It's impossible to think about it because you're not real. You have to be real to God and to yourself. When I say real to yourself, you've got to be real to God first and real to yourself. Don't say, I want to be real to me and never bother about God. This is what the world is saying. Then you can do anything, everything, you just follow your heart's desire, big problem. Therefore, you can never be lukewarm. It's just not possible. Because if it is, then you don't really know him. You haven't read those verses. You have not reflected upon these verses. No one can possibly be not in deep good friendship with the man who loves so loves you. Then he said, you didn't choose me. Did you hear that? Verse, uh, um, it, it, right after that, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. This Armenianism out of the window already. Calvinism go right in here. He said, you did not choose me, I chose you. No, now let's get this right. You go to heaven because he chose you. And you cannot suffer a little bit for him in this world. Because if he didn't choose you, you would suffer far more later on. The world may love you now, but he chose you. Remember this very important reform doctrine. You did not choose Jesus. Jesus chose you, and then you, you follow him. You respond to him. Don't think that I made a decision for Jesus. It's me. Holy Spirit, God spoke to me, moved my heart, and then I make a decision. This is Billy Graham's uh, evangelistic message, right, basically. It's kind of right, but if you go deep down with the theological nuance, well, the word of Jesus, that is not correct. The correct statement is, Jesus chose me, he moved my heart, then I respond. Because he chose me, right? Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Then he talks about the hatred of the world, verse 18. If the world hates you, know they has hated me before it hated you. If you were the world, the world would love you. <laughs> Do you hear that? As its own, because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. After all this, he said, the world will hate you. You know, if you pick up verse 18 directly, the world hates you because hated me before you go like, yeah, too bad. I become so hard to become Christians. I get hated by the world. Yeah, but Jesus, you love me. I'm going to suck it down. I'm trying to be hard. I'm trying to follow you. I would try. I would try. I would try. Don't try. Read the verses before. Read verses 13 to 17. Jesus said, I lay down my life for you. And I, you are my friends for now. You're no more my servants. And then he say, the world will hate you. He's preparing us. With all this backdrop, you are going to overcome the world. That's the message. You are going to overcome the world, no matter how much the world hates you or not. Because you are not of this world. The, the record of church history shows that Christian truth is constantly opposed by some new heresy or change in cultural trends. You know how cultural trends change so many times? Every few years they change. Right? I mean, same-sex marriage 30, 40 years ago be frowned upon, be like, what? Today is like legal, and, and, and if, you, if you don't accept it, it's like, what's wrong with you? Christians, you are on the wrong side of history. 
56, the Carl Truman, a very famous professor, he's he written a book on this thing. He said, 60, 70 years ago, my dad would never even, if you ask this question, he'd go like, what? What are you talking about? A man is to be the head of the family, take care of the family, provide for your family. That 60 years ago, 70 years ago. The cultural trends flip flop all the time. That's why, apart from special blessings from God's spirit, Christian ministry will be difficult. Do not be under the illusion that Christian ministry will be easy. It's never easy. If you think it's easy, look at Jesus' life. The Son of God himself, do you think that is easy? Uh, let's look at just a person, a human being, okay? Because Jesus is God himself, right? Let's look at Paul. Do you think that is easy? Paul's probably gone through more than anybody. Peter. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at Abraham, well, he is pretty easy, right? He is a very rich man. Uh, he's, he's, he's got a, a thousand servants for him. He was tested severely to, suffer, to open out his son, correct? But apart from that, he is doing very well. Look at David. He was really doing well. Financially, power, and everything. Women, you name it, everything. But God judged him a lot. But I'm just saying just real quick here. The Old Testament and New Testament now, we have a very different time now. Okay, so these are the two things I want you to know. God wants us to persevere. He wants to train us to be consistent, to consistent and fervent prayer. I encourage you to come on Wednesday night Zoom prayer meeting, 8 o'clock. This morning, we had new people coming to pray. That was wonderful to see new ones praying. Canaan was praying good. As he promises that if we continue to trust and obey, our labor will not be in vain. That's a promise of God. Paul encourages in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So do not give up. Okay, number three. And then number four. Three is very short. Three, why the silence from God at times when we go through trials and hardships? This will be a burning question for a lot of people. Why is God so silent at times? Well, the answer from this passage, the answer is that Jesus was up on the mountain watching his disciples struggling, fighting against a storm, and disciples probably think, where is Jesus? And he's on the mountaintop, seeing everything. And what's he doing? Jesus, what's, what's he doing? You tell me. What was the Lord doing while the disciples were struggling? He was praying. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. When we go through hard times, Jesus is praying for us. They were under his caring eyes the whole time. This is from commentary, uh, what is his name? Philips. Philip says this, as he measured out the trials that would strengthen their faith. As Jesus watched them struggle, and Jesus measuring how much struggle should I allow them to give to them so that they become stronger and stronger in their faith. That is what God is doing. That's what the commentary said, and I quite agree with that. And what John merely implies is made explicit by Matthew and Mark. Matthew 14 and Mark 6. These are all Matthew, Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 6 are all talking about Jesus walking the water after, after, uh, after, healing, uh, after feeding 5,000 men and 20,000 others all together. And then Jesus was walking on the water towards them in the boat. So Jesus was praying up there, high up in the world, above the world's raging power. The world was raging. America's raging. So much is going on. God, Jesus looking from above. He sees everything. He knows exactly what's happening. And he's, what was Jesus doing? High in a place of authority and communion with the Heavenly Father. Jesus was watching and praying for them. Let me give you two verses that will, that will just cut down this, this, this point. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray, that as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. 
the Holy Spirit intercedes and pray for us with groanings too deep for words. So, do you think Holy Spirit prays very intensely? He prays with groaning, groan, like in pain and anguish. That is God. God, the Holy Spirit, pray for us with groanings. I think I mentioned this before one of my previous sermons. When was the last time you prayed with groanings for your children? When was the last time you actually prayed? Did you ever pray in groanings? I said that the possible in my life, the one that I possibly pray in groanings is not for my children. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He groans for you. That means He knows there's a lot of work in you. He knows you need help. He knows that I need help. He groans. When He sees your suffering, you know, your marriage or anything, relationship is going through a hard time, or your children giving troubles, problems, He groans for you. You know, theologically, that's my, my, my struggle at times. Because he's omnipotent. He can do anything he wants. And yet he groans for us. Why? Why can't he just solve it? You know why? I thought about it. I think it's the word righteousness. God will not shortcut it. God will not. Because he has to satisfy who he is. He's a God of righteousness. 400 years. Do you know that? Israel suffered under the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt for 400 years. Why didn't God act earlier? He's a sovereign God. Ask no more. Because I have no answer and you will not have answer. He does what is the best in his sovereignty. Certain things God reveals to us, this is our right, our blessings. But the certain things belong to God. You will never know. And God sent Moses in to deliver them. You know, just like the boat. People were struggling until 3 o'clock in the morning and Jesus walked to them. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 to 25 says the same thing. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because, he's con- because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus always lives to make intercession for you. Jesus, the God-man, still praying in heaven on his throne as a man, as a perfect man, as the redeemer man, praying to God the Father, while he himself is still also God the Son. Another mystery. So, Jesus always praying. When you go through trials, he's praying. So can you imagine that while we groan, moan, and stress out like the disciples fighting against a strong wind against them, Jesus was praying over us, watching over us. The disciples know that Jesus was praying for them. He, they didn't know, but, the, but they, they would. By the time 3 o'clock came, 3 to 6 a.m., Jesus started walking in the water. They knew our Savior is here. Hallelujah. Let me go to my last point, point four. Last point. It's a, it's a longer point, okay? So, last point. How does Christ help us in times of hardship and trials? How does Jesus help us? Number one, Christ steps into our storm to help us. I really love this. Actually, this commentary, Philip said that <clears throat> Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. Jesus did not come to them when everything is good. God comes to them when everything is wrong. When the crucial time the boat was about to sink, they were about to vomit, they were about to perish. It was so shaken by the wind and everything. It was so dark. They were about to give out hope. They said, what is going on? Jesus stepped into the storm. You know, I thought about this. There's a couple of ways Jesus could skin this cat, right? He can do this thing. He's, he's, he he walked on water for three, four miles. Catch up with them, number one. Number two, when he got into the boat, the boat immediately got another eight miles, about 12 miles. So about, about another eight, nine miles, they reached the shore. Just like that. What is that telling us? 
I thought about this. Jesus could have not. He did not even have to walk on the water to them. Jesus could say, "Stop! Calm down, storm. Could have calmed down right away, and then give them peace. And they walk slowly, and then he can walk very fast, and he cut catch up with them. But he didn't. He let the storm rage in our lives. You know that. He let the storms rage and pound the disciples, and then he stepped into the storm. Hallelujah." That's what I love about this Savior, because He did not run away from us when we're in trouble. He did not choose the easy way. He walked right into the storm. That is the story of Christmas. That is the story of Good Friday, Resurrection uh, Sunday, the, the 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 Easter Sunday. That is the story of God stepping into human history. That is the story of incarnation. God walked into our storm and be part of our storm. Do you, do you not think that storm hit Jesus? Of course it did. Okay, he could walk. I don't know the detail because it's not written in the Bible, but I'm telling you, he was experiencing storm just like the disciples did because the storm only calmed down after he got into the boat. Did you notice that? God chose to walk into the storms hand in hand with you. That is our God. That is the Lord we serve. That's the God that say, I call you friends. I am coming to you. I will walk with you through your times of trials, your times of hardship, your times of struggle with your friend, with your wife, with your husband, with your children. I'm going to come in and walk through this with you. When your kids go to uh, to, uh, to high school, go to college, when they think the storm's going to hit them, Jesus promised He's going to walk into the storm with you. Only if you obey His commands and He be your friend. You've got to trust Him. He, he walked into it. What a powerful thing. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus suffered once for, God, for sins. You know why the Bible says once? There's no more crucifixion. There's no more. It is done. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus said, it's finished. Before he breathed his last breath, he said, it's finished. Hallelujah. That's a those are the most glorious three words. After all this anguish, he came to this world. He said, I cannot wait for the baptism. I have a baptism to undergo. And that is the death, dying on the cross. When he said it's finished, his baptism is done. He's, he's ready to rise. Hallelujah. His work is done. It's not easy. You think it's so easy for Jesus? He cried. Did you know that he cried? Son, God, the God-man cried. With loud wailings, he cried out to Abba, Father, take this cup from me. I don't want it. If you put it in modern language, I don't want it, Lord. Lord, I'm scared. I really, I, 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 if it's possible, pass from me. That's exactly what Satan offered him, right? Bow down to me, I'll give it to you. The cup will pass. And Jesus said, you only worship the Lord your God. But to God the Father, he talks like the second Trinitarian God person now. He said, Father, let your will be done, not my will. This is, this is glorious. This, this, kind of, this kind of God you, you need to pay attention to. He suffered once, okay? And, and uh, that's why when Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, the verse 3 says, God promised, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Point number two. I have three points, sub points, we're done. Sub point number two, Christ comes and helps at the right timing. Now, this is tricky because... Because Jesus waited for quite a while until 3, to 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. A third lesson deals with the timing of Jesus' appearance. Matthew tells us that it was the fourth watch of the night. 
fourth watch of the night is about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, so he could have come at 1 or 12 or whatever, you know, but he chose to come at, 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 at the peak of it. When the disciples had been rowing for hours and were most weary and dismayed, when they were tired and weary and dismayed, how often the Lord waits for the last, for the last extremity before arriving with eight? Philip's writes in the commentary. How often the Lord waits for the last extremity before coming with help? Many Christians can attest that it was just as the bill was due that the money arrived or just when the food ran out, a friend was sent to help. You heard these stories, right? The amount comes in just the right amount. This is some of the testimony I heard in all this. The lesson is never to give up trusting the Lord to come at the right time of need. How often is the fourth watch? How often it is in the fourth watch that Jesus walks on, to, on the water to bring us aid? You know why not too early? Because if he comes too early, he blown it. He, he did not have a chance to, to really refine you. If he comes too late, you'll be drowned. So he's not going to let this too happen. He's going to come at the right time. Okay, sub point number three. This is the, the biggest point of my sermon today, sort of to help you. Christ's power to overcome our problems. Now I want to talk about Christ's power to overcome our problems. This miracle displays Christ's power to overcome our problems. This is the faith of John's signs to prove the deity of Christ. Jesus could walk on the stormy waters because he is the Lord and maker. With the same power, he brought peace to the storm. Mark says in Mark chapter 6, verse 51, he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. He got into the boat, the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus has power to steal the storm that rages against you and to speak peace to your heart. Now, this is a big statement I want to give to you now. This is from Philip's the commentary as well. This shows that our greatest need is not to be preserved from earthly troubles, but to realize the divine majesty of, the Lord, of our Lord and Savior, a truth that we often neglect in sunny days. Our need and our prayer should not always be say, deliver me from my troubles. The Lord's Prayer actually says, deliver me from the evil one. The Lord's Prayer never said, deliver me from my troubles. But from the evil one, yes. Because if, you del- if God delivers you from, the, from your troubles, the troubles will keep coming back every other time. But if you want to go, if the, the really the deeper question, the deeper issue God wants to deal with us is so that we see His majesty, so that we know that every time the troubles come and hit us, we know the divinity, the majesty of the Lord our God. Then nothing can touch us. Come then may be, but I'm ready. Hallelujah. But if you always want to mechanic solve this, solve this, you never learn, you never go to trust, you never realize who your God is. This is a brilliant statement. Our greatest need is not to be preserved from our troubles on earth. Our greatest need to realize the divine majesty of our Lord and Savior. Think about that. How true is that? You go and read Psalms, reflect on the glory of Christ. They will sing it to you more and more. I put up a, a Spotify talk. I sent to, I think all of, most of you, all of you, is follow up on Meditation. Don't do your Bible reading as a Bible study. Every morning, do it devotionally. There's the two different things to, start, to read the Bible devotionally every morning and also read the Bible like a Bible study. You're not teaching. Just get on with the Lord. Some Bible, Bible references is good. It's fine. I do that. But your goal is that, Lord, touch me. See, that's what the, sign, the, 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 the word is here. That our greatest need is to realize the divine majesty. This is how Christians learn to bless their trials for the lesson they have taught of God's grace. Psalm 63, verse 1, verse 4. I want to expound on this one, and I think that will be the last one. This is, this is an important one. Psalm 63, verse 1, verse 4 says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My, my flesh faints for you. 
as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. This is the key word here. I want to expound here. First, Psalmist, or David wrote this, he said, what was, what was the condition he was in? He said, my soul thirsts for you, my, my flesh faints for you. I'm a dry, weary land where there's no water. He is tired, he is depressed, he is having trouble in his life. He said, God, I long for you. I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm in this dry and weary land. Put it to yourself. You're going through a hard time spiritually. You're feeling dry, you're feeling weary. Lord, I need you, God. My soul thirsts for you. And then what? And the verse Verse 2, it says, So I looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. That's a turning point. And then it says, Because your steadfast, is, steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I will bless your name. Did he experience the steadfast love yet? He was still in the dry and weary land when he said verse 3. Verse 2 and verse 3. Nothing has changed physically in this world, but everything spiritually has changed. He was still very weary and dry, having deep troubles. But he cried, he looked to God. Behold is a very important word. Behold. He, the ability to behold, to experience, to see the glory and the majesty of God in your tough time, in your difficult times, in your dryness time, is very, very powerful, very, very important. You cannot just behold God's glory when everything is good. Come into the house of God. Everything is great. Let's dance. Let's praise. Let's raise our hands and worship the Lord. Let's the guitar play and the drum play. We praise the Lord. We love that. But it is when it is dry and weary. Still do that. And you see all these things going to happen. He said, I behold your power and glory. Behold comes from meditation. Behold comes to, and where did he get to behold? He goes to the sanctuary. Where's the sanctuary? Church. He goes to church. He feels very dry. So you know people who feel dry and spiritually troubled and downcast never, never stop coming to church. Even all the more you should come to church. Like Psalm 63, what David did. I'm going through a hard time, Lord. I'm going through a dry, weary land. So I looked upon you in the sanctuary. He did not look to the sanctuary when he go away and then run away from the Lord, you know. He go back to the house of God and look and behold the glory of God, the divine, the, 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 the power and the glory of God. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready. Is he ready? He is ready. But has he overcome yet? He has not. He's still in the situation. That's the kind of prayer. That's the kind of thing to overcome. Moses said, in Psalm 33, verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, The very thing you spoke spoken, I, I, I will do for you. You found favor in my sight. I know you by name. Then Moses said, verse 18. Moses said, Please show me your glory. Show me your glory. That's the kind of prayer we can pray. When you're going through hard times, Show me your glory, O Lord. And then lastly, it is, you know, when, when, when Jesus is coming on the, on the waters of the disciples, Jesus say, it is I. Fear not, it is I. That I in Greek is ego emi. Ego emi, in, which is a translation of the name of the name Yahweh in the Old Testament. And that is the name God gave to Moses at the burning bush. That means the God who spoke to Moses is the God who walked on the water towards the disciples. The disciples, knowing the Hebrew background, they must be shocked. That is the same person who spoke to Moses. We are ready, God. Jesus, thank you. We are ready to follow you. We trust you. We believe in you. Can you believe the faith of the disciples after Jesus said, I am. The same I am that God spoke to Moses. Moses said, what's your name? My name's I am. And Jesus said, I am. Same words. He's the Yahweh. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one. And, and, and the 
Can you believe, can you imagine the faith of the disciples after Jesus came to the boat? The storm died down immediately. The faith jumped 100 times. And next, the, the boat came, uh, at the super speed, boom, eight miles right to the shore. Now jump another 100 times, 200 times. What a deal. You see, they got the contrast. If they did not sweat over uh, the, the, the anguish and the struggle with the storms till 3 o'clock in the morning, the glory will not be so great. And Jesus let them wait, build it in, let them struggle to the point he comes in. Now they know who Jesus really is. Let me conclude here. You know, after this event, a few months later, Jesus goes to the cross. The glorious one who walked on the water, who uses the I am, same name that Yahweh used to, same to speak to Moses. The same one that got into the boat, the boat that storm died, the boat straight away got to the shore. The same person now, three months later, hanging on the cross, bleeding for them. What is happening? Jesus is preparing them. My people, I will suffer for you, so don't be shocked. I'm doing all these great things. I could, I could avoid the cross if I wanted to. You know, you know to me, the, the greatest glorious moment is not when Jesus walked on the water. It's not when the boat get to the shore immediately. It's not even when he raised the dead from, Lazarus from the dead. The glorious moment is when he died on the cross. That is the greatest moment when he said, it's finished. To me, that is the hardest choice he made. To me, that is the most majestic moment. The glory of God. You must get, you must get that. That is our God. Let's pray.